We're in this new teaching series called The Future You. This is actually week two of that series, and if you missed last week, I'm telling you, church, you have to go back and see Doug's message. It was awesome. Was that not good last week? Today, we're going to continue the series, and we're going to ask a pivotal question that every single one of us is going to want to be able to answer, and the question is this. How do I actually become the person I want to be? That's a good one, isn't it? I mean, if we can start to get some answers to that question, like that question alone right there can begin to change the trajectory of our entire lives, can it? And, and so today we're, gonna, we're just going to hit the tip of the iceberg today. We're just going to start this conversation today. Doug's going to continue it next week. Whatever you do, don't miss next week. But we're going to start to answer that question today. In fact, the title of today's message, I'm going I'm to encourage you. I don't say this often. I'm going to encourage you to take some notes today. This is going to be a good day to take notes. Amen. Okay, here's the title if you're taking notes. How to become who you want to be. How to become who you want to be. As a parent, I have done what a lot of you parents have done. I've been asking my kids since they were old enough to talk almost, son, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I have gotten some crazy answers over the years. In fact, me and Jill were laughing about them this morning. I wrote a couple down. Ethan once told me when he was a little kid, he said, dad, I either want to be a pastor or a zookeeper. I said, well, son, both deal with a lot of crap, so you're fine. (laughs) Jill's like, you can't say that. Ashton said, I'm either going to work for the NFL, the NBA, or Subway. (laughs) So he's got big plans going in different directions. And Austin told me when he was little, he's loved Legos ever since he was a little kid. He said, Dad, I either want to be, what did he say? Oh, he said, I want to be an architect or a dinosaur. And so he's got big decisions as well. Um, I remember one time we were at Austin's baseball game. He was just a little kid, and he's playing center field. And everybody in the infield and outfield, they're looking at the batter except for my son. He's looking at the back fence, and he's back there doing this. And I knew what he was doing, working on his career. I knew what he was doing. I said, son, I came in, son, I went over to the dugout. I said, son, what are you doing out there? He said, I'm being a dinosaur. I said, Jill... I got to go to the car. (laughs) Pray for me, babe. (laughs) I've been asking him that for a long time. I started getting real serious, though, with that talk when they hit 13. When my boys hit 13, we do what we call become a man trip. And we do a father-son trip. They get to choose the destination. We go somewhere that they want to go. We have some fun. But then they know we're going to have one big, serious conversation at a dinner. And I prepare them for this talk. I give them a list of questions that I want them to really think through what it means to start being a man. And in fact, I'm going to share that entire list with you in our next series. We're going to do a relationship series. I'm going to do a week on parenting, and I think it's going to really be helpful. It was super helpful to me. Um, In fact, here's a picture of all three boys on our 13-year-old Become a Man trip. My hair is just getting grayer each trip. Two of the questions they had to answer is, uh, they're this, who do you want to be and how are you going to get there? And I said, I don't want you to just come up with these answers off the cuff. I want you to spend some time with God over the next few weeks. I want you to to pray and to read and I want you to talk to God and let him talk to you. And because son, what I really want you to start to try to figure out is who does God want me to be? Because if you can begin to answer that question, son, it's going to change the direction of the rest of your life. And so we get, we, get, we get at dinner, and I bring them a gift. Each of the boys got a necklace to remember the trip and to remember some of their answers. And, and they would say things like, I want to stay pure till marriage. And I said, okay, that's great. What are the choices you need to start making now to become the man you want to be? One of them said, I want to be generous, Dad. I want to be remembered as being generous. That was another way I phrased the question to him. I said, sometimes I say, who do you want to become? Sometimes I say, how do you want to be remembered? I said, Dad, I want to be remembered as being generous. I said, son, that's fantastic. What are you going to start doing now? What choices are you going to, can you start making now so that someday you'll actually be the man that's remembered for being generous? One of the boys, all, actually all the boys said, I want to be closer to God. I said, that's great. What are we going to start doing now to make that a reality? And so I want to, I want to invite you to ask yourself those same two questions today. Who do I want to be and how am I going to get there? We need a vision for our life. The Bible says, for a lack of vision, people perish. 
If you just walk around aimlessly, which is what we're tempted to do, what we do is we sort of have some ideas in our mind of the man or woman we wanna be in the future, and we kinda just hope it happens miraculously on autopilot somehow. And the truth is, and we know this, but we don't like to think about it very often, you will never be the man or woman you want to be in the future on accident. We've gotta start figuring out, God, who do you want me to be, and then how do you want me to get there? What are some choices that I can begin to make in my life right now? Because if I don't, I won't. I remember being 24 years old and I didn't have a relationship with God at the time, but if you'd have asked me who I wanted to be, I would have told you, I wanna be a really good dad. I can't wait to be a dad. I wanna be a really good husband. And for some reason, I've always wanted to be known as someone who's generous. The problem was I wasn't making choices that were leading in those directions. I had a substance abuse problem. It's gonna be hard to be a good dad with a Coke addiction, but I didn't wanna face that truth. I'm just gonna someday be a really good dad. I'm gonna someday be a really good husband even though I lie to all my girlfriends and I'm usually not faithful. But someday I'm magically gonna be a really good husband. I'm gonna someday be remembered as being generous, but the truth is is I would steal from places I worked at and I was super selfish and everything was about me. But someday I'm gonna be remembered, you see what I'm saying? I wasn't headed in that direction. And so today, church, understand this. As you start to go to God this week and say, God, who's the person you want me to be? What's the future me look like? Understand this. If you see what you want to be and you realize you're not heading there, if you don't like what you're getting, we can change what we're doing. We can do that today. I tell my boys, spend time with God, and I want you to come up with these answers. And It's interesting because God tells us the same thing. In Proverbs 3, 6, he says this. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. And so I want to tell you the same thing I tell my boys. Pray, read, and fast. That's the homework for this week for some of you. Some of you go, man, I've already done this. I'm past this. I know the man or woman I want to be. Great. Some of you don't. I understand that, too, because I know what it feels like to live that way. What if this week... You joined us as a church. We're in the middle of this 21-day fast where that's exactly what we're doing. We're, we're praying together and we're reading together and we're fasting together. And we, we've done this for one week. So if you haven't joined us, you could join. You could start tomorrow. We start week two. Think about what could happen in your life if for the next 14 days you said, I'm going to fast something that my flesh wants and I'm going to spend some time letting God pour into my spirit beginning to direct me in who the man or woman he wants me to be, who that person looks like. And you can go to the website and get all that information. You can can fast all food. You can fast some food. You can fast a meal. You can fast things like TV or social media or whatever it is. We're just going to kill one thing that the flesh wants and spend some extra time with God saying, God, what do you want? Think about 14 days of that, what God could do in your life. Would you join us on this fast? We took our boys out for dinner at the beginning of the fast and said, boys, what are you going to fast? And the boys started going through it, and Austin said, Dad, I've, I've been praying, and I know what I'm going to fast. And I said, what's that, son? He said, Dad, I'm going to fast science class. <laughs> I said, son, I don't think that's a legitimate fast. <laughs> he's actually decided to fast video games, and every time he craves playing video games, he's going to step aside and just talk to God for a minute. Imagine what God could do if you join us on this fast for the next 14 days. Proverbs 21.5. Good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. God says, I want you to come spend time with me, and I'll help you figure out who you want to be. But then I expect you to start putting a plan in place to get there. He expects us to plan. He says, good planning gets the future you that you want. Bad planning just doesn't. My financial advisor has been telling me for years, If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And I was like, that's pretty cool. And this week I realized, you got that from God. He said it first. But that's true. God says, spend time with me. I'll help you figure out who you want to be. And then it's up to you to start putting together a plan to put yourself on the right path to get where you want to go. Proverbs 4.26 says this, consider well and watch carefully the path of your feet. 
He says, that's the part I want you to start thinking about. You've got to start making some choices that put you on the right path. I'll help you figure out where you want to go. I have a plan for your life. I have a calling for your life. Now you need to start considering well, being really, really careful about the choices you make today because every choice you make, it's, you're on a path. You're moving somewhere. You're going to make hundreds, if not thousands of decisions each day. And each decision is going to take you closer to the person you want to be or farther away from the person you want to be. But you get to choose. He gave us a free will. He said, that's why I'm telling you consider well the choices that you make. Because listen, intentions, they don't determine our destination. Decisions determine our destination. And that's what we get to choose, right? And we know this in other areas of life, but sometimes we don't apply it to our own life as far as the man or woman we want to be in the future. Like we know this, right? You go from anywhere in Denver and head over to I-70, and if you say, man, the future me is going to be in Vail. That's where the future me is going to be. And that's a good thing to do. That's a good place. But if you go to I-70 and choose or decide to go east, the future you is not going to Vail. You can hope it is. You can tell everybody in your life, I feel called to Vail. I really want to be in Vail. Get this, you can pray, God help me get to Vail. But if you choose to go east, you're not going to Vail, you're going to Kansas. And I promise they're not the same. Our decisions determine our destination, and God says, I want you to come up with a plan to start making the right decisions that will begin to determine that your destination is going where you want it to go. So today I want to get real practical, and I hope a little inspirational for you. I want to help you devise a plan, all right? So here's the first thing I want you to write down. We're going to start small. A lot of what I'm going to talk to you about today has come from a, a book that I've just been going through called Atomic Habits by James Clear. Highly recommend it. Great book. Um, I've read his book. I've listened to some interviews with him and some other guys who have written on this subject. And, and I feel like there's, there's a lot of things that I tend to do that are almost counterproductive. I do the thing where I go, hey, I think it's time to get in shape. I'm only going to eat vegetables for the rest of my life. And four days later, I cheat, I go get two blizzards, and I'm fatter than I was when I started. Because I start too big, right? Here's what he says in his book. He says, every action you take, it's a vote for the type of person you wish to become. No single instance will transform your beliefs, but as the votes build up, so does the evidence of your new identity, as you start to continually make small choices that lead you to the person you want to be, it starts to actually begin to change who you are. This is one reason why meaningful change does not require radical change. Small habits can make a meaningful difference by providing evidence of a new identity. And if change is meaningful, it is actually big. That's the paradox of making small improvements. It's brilliant, isn't it? Here's what he's saying. If you say, man, the future me is, is in better shape. That's one of the things I want. I, I want to be in better shape. However, I've been sitting on a couch for three years. You probably don't want to sign up for a triathlon this month. You see what I'm saying? You might want to start with, what if just like on those random lunches where I no plan and I get in a hurry and I grab a double cheeseburger, what if I just had a salad? Like, what if you started there with a salad instead of McDonald's? What, what, what if you started with 10 push-ups? I heard Pastor Craig Rochelle talk about this, and he's brilliant in this subject. In fact, he's got a new book coming out called The Power to Change. You can pre-order it right now. I guarantee it's going to be helpful. But he talks about this, and he says, what if, if you want to get in better shape, you didn't start with, I'm going to go run a marathon today and do this crazy crash diet. What if you started with, I'll do 10 push-ups? And some of you go, man, I can't do 10 push-ups. Okay, do five. I can't do five push-ups. Do one. I don't think I could do a push-up. Do a push-up on your knees. I don't think I could do a push-up on my knees. Lay down on the ground and stand up one time a day. Start there. Like, start small and watch what happens. I read a story this week where a guy lost 100 pounds by going to the gym for five minutes a day. Some of you are like, hey, I need that exercise plan. He had a, he had a counselor who said, I know that you want to be in better shape. Your problem is you got these big lofty goals and you never stick with them. So he said, here's the deal. For the next few months, you're going to go to the gym every day, but you can only go for five minutes. Can't stay six. 
Go to the gym, get on a treadmill, get on a bike, go pick something up, go sit in the sauna. Five minutes and you go home. He said, I felt really stupid doing that. He said, but what happened is, is over time, I do that for a few months. He says, here's what happens. I began to become a person who goes to the gym. And five minutes eventually turned into 10 minutes. And 10 minutes turned into 15 minutes. And then I started to get a little more comfortable. And I started to learn how to use some of the equipment. And I stopped comparing myself to everybody who'd been coming there for the last 20 years and dropped my pride and said, I'm just going to do this because I have a dream, because I have a calling, because this is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I want to work on that today. And five minutes in the gym turned into something else, turned into something gigantic. He lost 100 pounds. Compound interest. It's small decisions turn into big results when we stay with it, don't they? My hope is that as every, as, as every single one of you are going, this is who I want to be in the future, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm going to write it down. I'm going to get real serious about it. My hope is that at the top of your list is I want to be closer to God. The person I want to be, I want to know God. I want to have a relationship with God, not something that I hear other people talk about. I want to have that. I want to serve him. I want to build his kingdom. I want to get closer to him. I would say the same thing. Start small. See, I used to make this mistake. I used to tell everyone who would, we've had so many people over the years say, I want to give my life to God. And I used to say this all the time. I go, here's what I want you to do. Start reading one chapter of Matthew or John. Read one chapter in the Old Testament. Read one chapter of Psalms. And we'd read one chapter of Proverbs each day. Go get them, kid. And they try that for like four days, miss two days, feel guilty, decide God's done with them and quit. Come on, how many of you who really want to be closer to God have started a one-year Bible reading plan? Come on, can we be honest? And some time goes by and you miss a few days and then you get back on the plan and it reminds you every day what a loser you are. You should be on day 24, you're on day six. And finally you go, God's, God's definitely done with me, I quit. Right, is that just me? <laughs> what if you started with a verse? I mean this. What if you started with, with one page or one chapter or something that's small, that's easy, that you know you could continue doing? I read a study this week that said, if you read the Bible six minutes a day, you'll read the whole thing in two years. How many of you two years ago had said, I wish I had read the whole Bible? But it's just, it's too overwhelming. It's too gigantic. The mountain's too high to climb. What if you just read for six minutes a day? Two years from now, you'll have read the whole thing. Imagine how much closer to God you'd feel. See what I'm saying? Something small can turn into something big. And listen, I'm not just telling you to start small because a guy who wrote a really good book says it. I'm saying just don't be afraid to start small because God says it. Zechariah 4.10, do not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Some of you are going, I wanna get closer to God. I'm gonna start with a verse. I'm gonna start with a page. I'm gonna start with a two minute prayer. Here's what's happening in heaven. God right now in heaven's going, guys, guys, come here, come here, come here, let's throw a party. He's up there partying going, my daughter just started. My son just started. I think they could stick with this one. They got this. We can start small. Big change can happen from small God-ordained decisions that put us on the right path. Number one, start small. Number two, Schedule it. Write that down. Schedule it. <clears throat> Let's read this again. Good planning and hard work lead to the future you, you dream of. Lead to prosperity. We're supposed to plan. And look, we know how this works in life. Like if it doesn't go on the calendar for a lot of us, let's be honest, it doesn't happen. Right? That's why you still haven't had dinner with that couple you've been talking about having dinner with for the last six months because you just haven't put it on the calendar yet. That's why you've never actually started that workout plan you've been talking about starting for a year, because you just never took it out of the realm of good intentions and actually scheduled it into your life. That's why you haven't spent time with God like you said you wanted to last year, because it's a really good intention. I just never actually put it on a calendar and actually scheduled it. What if it started this small? Tomorrow, I join the, 14, the rest of this 14-day fast. I'm going to set my alarm for 7 a.m. This goes on the calendar, 7 a.m. At 7.05, I'm making coffee. While it brews, I do 10 push-ups. Then I go to my favorite chair, and I read the Bible for five minutes. I pray for five minutes. At 7.20, I'm showering, and I have just put myself on a path to becoming the person I think God's calling me to be. 
You see what I'm saying? It starts scheduling. It starts changing things. I was reading this in this book, Atomic Habits. This is super interesting to me. Uh, in Great Britain, they got together. I think it was 248. Yeah, 248 people. And they did this. They did this study group. They, they, they got 248 people together who wanted to have better exercise habits, okay? <clears throat> and they, they divided these people into three groups. And the first group, they said, what we want you to do, you really want to work out, you've told us that, track your workouts, and we'll get back with you. Go get them. And then they went to the second group, and they said, we want you to track your workouts, but they also put this group through some extensive teachings on here's all the benefits to working out and all the benefits of exercise, and here's how it'll help you avoid the, uh, avoid, uh, the possible risks of, of heart disease and heart failure, and here's all the ways it'll improve your life. Now you track your workouts, go get them. And then they took the third group, and they said, you do those two things, but you can't leave here today until you finish this sentence. Go ahead and put that up. Guys, take a screenshot of this, because I'm telling you, you put anything that you want to start doing in this sentence and watch what sort of progress you start to make. Here's what they had to write. During the next week, I will exercise for 20 minutes on this day, at this time, in this place. They were scheduling it. He said the results were, were staggering. The first group, 35% of the people actually worked out. The second group, with all that education and all that training on what exercise was going to do for your life, you know how many worked out? About 35%. The group who said, this is when I'm going to do it and where I'm going to do it and actually put it on a calendar, 91% of them followed through with, with what they said they wanted to do. Scheduling, it makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? Good planning and hard work. Scheduling is the planning. Hard work starts with point three, and write this down, stick with it. Start small, schedule it, and then stick with it. Pastor Craig says this, successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. Let me say that again. Successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. You see somebody who's financially successful, you can guarantee they've been doing some, they've been making some real wise financial choice, choices for a long time. Find someone who's really close to God, they've been making some really good choices to put them in that position for a long time. Find someone who's successful, whatever they do, they've been making some choices consistently over time to get them there, right? God says it like this, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. God says, if you'll just start spending some time with me, I'll, I'll, I'll put you on the path. I'll show you where I want to take you. And if you'll start with your free will, making some God ordained choices to say, I'm going to take one small step today towards the person I think you're calling me to be. And if you'll actually stick with it, there's going to be a point in your life where you turn around and go, oh my gosh, I am reaping the reward. I actually stuck with it. And look, God took a small choice and turned it into some gigantic changes in my life. As I was, as I was studying for today, I kept coming across all of these examples of people who had made little changes and experienced or little decisions and experience big changes. And, and so I, I started writing down some of them. I started coming up with some of my own. And I want to share a handful of these with you as I, as I land this plane on this message, because I hope that it, what it does is it starts to spark some ideas in your mind about what you could do, about what you could start to talk to God about. And I want to show you what happens when small changes over a certain amount of time turn into big results. Go ahead and put that first one up. Let's say, for example, that some of you go, man, the future me, I, I really do want to be healthier. I want to take care of my body. It is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I want to be around for a long time. I want to see my kids grow up, all that stuff. Let's say you just did the 10 push-ups and one salad thing. It's almost insulting to start that as your workout plan, isn't it? Like, I got more in me. Let's just say that's all you did. 10 push-ups a day and one salad. And none of us are perfect. Like, so let's say you miss a quarter of the time. Like 25% of the time, I just don't do it. Do that for two years, and here's what you've done. You've done over 5,000 push-ups and had 547 salads instead of double cheeseburgers. You think that's not going to affect your health? It's a small decision over time, turns into some pretty big things. Put that next one up. 
This one is personal for me because I have been feeling lately like God has put it on my heart to write another book. I don't want to write another book. I want to have written another book. That's what I want. I don't, I know the process now. I don't, it's painful. I got to come up with the whole thing and the theme and the journey I'm going to take someone on. And why would you even turn the page? And what's the title? And I know the process. I got to have an outline. I got to know what every single chapter is about. And I got to write sample chapters. And then I got to write paragraphs about every chapter in the book. And then it's got to go to the editor. And then it's got to go to publishers. And then we got to have meetings with publishers. And then I got to actually go write the whole thing. I don't want to do it. And you know what? I've been feeling this for about six months. I have not written one sentence because it's so overwhelming. You ever have something in your life where you're like, I know this is what I think this is what God's calling me to do. It feels so overwhelming. I'm not even going to start. I thought this, what if, what if that's you? What if, what if you want to write a book? Or what if you want to start a company and you just need to put together a business plan? God's got something burning in your heart. What if for three months we went and we just took two or three minutes in the morning and wrote down one thought? Doesn't have to match yesterday's thought. Doesn't have to have anything to do with tomorrow's thought. Doesn't even have to ever be useful. Just one thought. If we did that for three months and missed 25% of the time, here's what we'll have done. We'll have written down 67 ideas. And you know what I thought for me? If I would do that on month four, all I have to do is go back and explain what I was talking about at those 67 ideas. I might have written two books. You might have wrote, written two business plans. You see what I'm saying? It's just something small, but over time, it can turn into something meaningful. Next one. We talk a lot about being generous at this church. In fact, from day one, we said, we may not be good at a lot of things at this church, but we're, we can be good at being generous, and that's going to be who we are. We're a generous church. And I know, I know a whole bunch of you, that's really gotten you excited, and you've wanted to be a part of that. And I know a whole bunch of you, if, if you were honest, you'd say, man, I want, to be, I want to be known as being generous. At the end of my life, I want people to look at me and go, that person, they used their resources that God gave them to build his kingdom and make heaven more crowded. They actually made a difference with their resources. That's who they are. That's what we crave, a whole bunch of us. What if this idea of tithing, what if you stop talking about potentially one day and someday and when we and if I, what if you actually just scheduled it? What if you actually just went on the app or went on the website? And you know what? Let's start. And, and I'm just going gonna, gonna to set up recurring tithing every two weeks when I get paid. I'm just going to take that plunge. Do that for a couple months. Might not feel any difference. In fact, might just be a little bit afraid. Might be a little bit nervous. I know those feelings. If you do that for two years, though, check this out. Over 50 times. You get to read Malachi 3.10 and go, this verse, God is talking about me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, there will not be room enough to store it. I can't tell you how many business owners I've talked to that said, we finally started tithing on our business, and here we are two years later, and we can't believe what God has done because they finally just started scheduling what was only a good intention. Now, what if you go, you know what, that's great. I couldn't, you don't understand my situation. I couldn't tithe right now if I wanted to. No problem. Let's do what we've been talking about today. Start small. What if you just went on the app and set up recurring giving it 20 bucks a week? Start there. You do that for a few weeks, and here's the thought you might have is, who am I kidding? I'm not making a difference. I'm not doing anything meaningful. I'm not even making a dent. Do that for two years. Watch this. You've given over $2,000 to build God's kingdom and make heaven more crowded. And you're no longer talking about wanting to be remembered as someone who's generous. You actually get to go, no, this is who I am because it's how I live. It changes things. Next one. Let's talk about relationships for a minute. Most, most of us, if you're married, you would say, I want to be a better spouse. I want to have a better marriage. But I don't even know what to do. Sometimes that feels so overwhelming. I don't even know where to start. And I just, I thought about this. I thought, what if, what if, I'm talking about me, okay? I said, what if, what if I prayed for Jill every morning for two minutes? Just prayed for Jill. And, and what if my goal was, when I come home after work, I'm gonna walk in the house and we always hug and kiss and say, I love you. What if I started saying, I love you because? 
It's different. Not just I love you, I love you, I love you. No, I love you because you're so kind. And I love you because you're patient. And I love you because you love God. And like, that's different. What if that was my goal? Those are little bitty things. It takes less than five minutes a day. Might not feel like much at first. But if I miss 25% of the time and did that for two years, I will have prayed for my wife 547 times and told her I love you because 547 times. Tell me we won't have a better marriage. It's hard not to forgive somebody you've prayed for 547 times. It's hard to stay mad and be bitter with someone you've prayed for over 500 times. It's hard not to want to serve and prop somebody else's dreams up that you've prayed for over 500 times. One little decision can make huge differences, can it? Every single one of us would probably say, one of the things I want to be is I want to be a good friend. I want to be remembered as being a good friend. When I leave high school, I want people to think that of me. When I leave college, if I leave this job, if I move to a different city, when I leave this world, like that's how I want to be remembered. And I thought, I thought, what if we did this? What if Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and I'll do it for me right before I eat lunch, so I remember, that's when I do it. I send one text to one friend on Monday, one friend on Wednesday, and one friend on Friday. Less than 60 seconds. Just a, hey, I love you. Hey, I'm with you. Hey, I'm praying for you. Hey, I believe in you. Hey, I'm grateful for you. What if I did that for two years? Here's what I've done. I'll have sent three people over 100 messages telling them that I'm grateful for them and I believe in them and that I got their back and that I'm praying for them. I will be one of the best friends in their life, guaranteed. I'll probably encourage one of my friends almost more than anyone else on this planet those two years. I'll probably tell them I got your back and I'm praying for you maybe more than anyone else on this planet, and it'll take me less than 60 seconds three times a week. Do you see what I'm saying? Like these little things. Keep going. This is the last one. And again, my hope is this one's at the top of your list because I believe this is the most important one. And I just want to be closer to God but he's invisible and I'm me and I got a lot of issues and a lot of problems and I don't even know how this thing works. And what if, what if you just said, you know what, in the morning, I'm going to find a time, just, just a few minutes, I'm going to read his word and just a few minutes, I'm going to talk to him. You do that for a couple weeks, you might not feel any different. You miss 25% of the time and do that for two years though. You've had 547 conversations with the creator of the universe. Over 500 times, you've said, God, here's what's on my heart. Over 500 times, you've said, God, I'm going to open your word and let you speak to me. You don't think you've got a better relationship with God after 500 conversations? And it starts with a little bitty decision, but it can turn into something huge. And I want this for you guys. I want this for you so bad. Um, Jeremiah 29, 13 says this, when you come looking for me, you'll find me. When you get serious about finding me and you want it more than anything else, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. God's decree, I'll turn things around for you. That's what I want you to experience. And it can start real small. I've, I've lived it. This was my story. I got saved at 24. I left LA and went to this church in Illinois. And they told me, you know what? Just start reading the Bible and praying each morning. And so that became my goal. I'm going to read the Bible, and I'm going to pray. Just My goal was five minutes on each, and I missed a lot, but that was my goal. Two years later, me and some friends, we went back to L.A., and we saw my best friend who I used to live with in L.A. He ended up being the best man in my wedding. He's one of my closest friends. Like He, he knew me at that time more than almost anyone else, he knew me better than almost anyone else in the world. We walked in, we met him at a bar because that's where he was at. And I went in and I hugged him and he hugged me and then he just took a step back and he looked at me and he goes, you don't even look like the same person. I, w I dressed exactly the same. Thrift store pants, combat boots, chain wallet, two small t-shirt, leather jacket. Same thing. Same haircut, weighed the same. My, one of my best friends on the planet looked at me in my eyes. He saw something. So you're not even the same person. There wasn't one five-minute prayer that changed my life. There wasn't one five-minute Bible reading that changed my life. But I'm telling you this, hundreds of them did. After hundreds of them, 
most of them feeling like I wasn't accomplishing anything. After hundreds of them, somebody looked at me and said, you're not even the same person. That's how much life change I'd experienced. A little bitty decision turned into something huge. It's compound interest. C.S. Lewis says this about compound interest. Good and evil both increase at compound interest. That's why we got to be careful. The little decisions you make today, they're turning you into the future you. The future you's not a big mystery. Just look at the decisions you're making today, and if you keep doing those, that's the future you. It works both ways, for good and bad. Good and evil both increase at compound interest. That's why the little decisions you and I make every day are of such infinite importance. The smallest good act today is the capture of a strategic point from which you may be able to go on to victories you never dreamed of. That's compound interest. That's why God says, don't despise those small beginnings. Because if you're willing, if you're willing to make some small choices, some small God honoring choices that'll just put you on a path and that'll eventually over time. So God says, let me multiply your efforts 30, 60, 100 times. Let me multiply your small God honoring decision into some life changing things in your life. He says, that's what I do. I created compound interest. Our team, with the help of our friend Levi Lusco, we built these dominoes. And because this is a beautiful picture of compound interest. There's 15 of them in total before we, when we finish. Get this, this is how compound interest works. If we put another 15 on the other side of this, this one would be the height of the Empire State Building. That's how powerful this is, right? So here's, this is the future, this is the future you, right? And here's what we do. We go, I wanna be healthier. And so I wanna work out for one week and I want a six pack. One week didn't get her done. I want to I wanna eat good for one week. I want to lose 12 pounds. Doesn't work, does it? One choice by itself won't do it. It's the time that God uses to multiply the efforts, isn't it? I want to be remembered as being generous. I want to get to the end of my life, and I want to have people say, he used his resources not to build his kingdom. He used them to build God's kingdom. So here's what we want, though. I want to tithe for one month, and I want to be remembered as being generous. It doesn't work. I want to be closer to God. I want to read the Bible for one week. Every day, I'll, I'll pray for a whole month. Nothing. But here's what happens, church. God says, don't despise those small beginnings. Spend some time with me. I'll show you what I want you to be able to knock down in the future. Start small. Spend some time with me, and I'll show you who you want to be. Start really small. Let me multiply your efforts. Decide to stay with it and watch what I'll do. Decide to stay with it because I promise you, if you do, the future you will be really glad you did. That's it. That's what God wants. Would you stand up with me, church? Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. God says, I got the future you. I got the future you. I know who I want you to be. I got a calling on your life. Would you start small? Would you start spending some time with me? Let me put you on a path that's gonna lead you in that direction and then start making some small God-honoring choices today and watch what I will do. And if you do, I guarantee you, the future you, is gonna be really glad you did, amen? Amen, let's pray. God, I thank you that you're with us. I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for our lives, even if we don't know what that is today. So God, I pray right now that you would start to lift some weights off of our shoulders, take some stress, take some worry about our future off of our shoulders today. Remind us that you're in control, you're in charge, with you nothing is impossible. You heal diseases, you cure anxiety and depression, 
You heal marriages and relationships. You take care of finances. You do what we can't do. So God, would you help us today to begin to trust you again? Would you give us a newfound a hunger and desire in our heart to spend some time with you, God, so you can begin to guide and direct us towards the future person that you have in store for us. And God, would you give us some inspiration in our souls today? Would you remind us we can do this? Would you help us to start making some God-honoring choices that put us on a path so that one day we can turn around and go, look, I'm where God wanted me to be. With everyone's eyes closed, I want to ask one question as I wrap up. The very first domino that needs to fall for you to ever experience what God has for you in your life, it starts with saying, God, I want to give you my life. I want, to, I want you to forgive me of my sins. I want to take advantage of what Jesus did for me when he died on the cross to pay the price for those sins. I want forgiveness of my sins. I want to start a new life with you. I want to walk with you. I'm not going to be perfect. I don't know how this is going to turn out, but Jesus, I need you. I can feel it in my heart. I want heaven forever. And so today is my day. I just know it. If that's you, and today you say, I want to say yes to beginning a relationship with Jesus. If that's you right now, raise your hand. I'm going to say a prayer for you all over. Raise them up. Raise them up. Yes, God, thank you. Thank you for the life change that's happening right now, literally around the world. God, speak to us, inspire us, build us up, build up our confidence as we begin to pursue the person you're calling us to be. And God, thank you for the eternal lives that are being changed right now. I pray as we begin to worship you with music that we would sense your presence in a very real and authentic way. God, we thank you for everything you do for us. We love you so much. And this church family, together we say, God, it's our honor to worship you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Let's worship, church.